for many artists, I think that one of the most challenging, certainly one of the most overwhelming, one of the most complex topics is the subject of backgrounds. When I came to create my first professional illustrated comic, it was this one, Seven Pirates, and no surprise, there were a large variety of pirate ships, taverns, deserted islands, and all sorts of other things that I had to draw in the background. It was a massive challenge, and it's something that stressed me out a lot at the time. So much so, in fact, that when I came to do my second book, I set the whole thing in a forest because I knew that that way I'd only have to draw trees. Because of this, I'm actually going to do a series of videos on backgrounds. This is really going to delve into a lot of the topics that you might find when you're trying to create backgrounds for illustrations or comics. I'm going to cover things like using 3D as a base or a major element for background or for illustration in general. Also, we'll cover reusing the backgrounds. Can you do that? And also how you go about planning complicated scenes where you have to kind of figure out, OK, the camera's here. What am I actually likely to see? How do I keep this scene consistent? So it should be a fun little series. But first, in this video, what I want to cover is, I think, one of the most important topics. You see, a lot of what actually goes into deciding what we draw as a background how much detail we need to put into it, how much we need to plan it. What actually needs to go in there is very much defined by the type of medium that we're engaging in. A lot of that comes down to how much time we have to create something. What is our artistic intent? And one of the things that I was really missing early on was just an actual appreciation for the varieties of different things that could be drawn in the background and also a real lack of looking at what actually was there. So what I want to do in this video is just discuss the most basic, but in my opinion, the most important thing, which is how much background do you need? So we're going to actually look at a variety of different artists that I think are really good examples of this and just get a feeling for different genres of comic, different types of illustration and how much background is actually there when you actually need it. And depending on your story, again, good examples of where you can go crazy and make really, really amazing backgrounds or sometimes just get away with almost nothing. So I know a lot of the questions you might have are actually more practical, like how do I draw this? What are the tricks, etc. But first, I think it's really important to just look at what works. Anyway, this should be a fun one. So let's jump in and get started. All right, welcome to The Drawing Codex. My name is Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this channel, we're all about drawing cool stuff from our imagination, embracing the challenge of drawing and mastering the craft of line and color illustration. Now, if you'd like to learn more about line and color illustration, just quickly, you can check out my free quick start guide. It's aimed to get you up and running in Photoshop developing your own simple, reliable line and color process. This is the same process and style that I use for most of my comics and other projects. You will get all of the PSDs and brushes that are involved in that quick start guide. So go check it out. Now, I know a lot of people who begin drawing characters, which was definitely me. It's easy to run from the idea of drawing backgrounds and sort of try and escape this issue. And often, you know, that's one of the things I did in the beginning is kind of just, you know, draw some vague thing in the background and really just focus on the characters. But the more I've developed over the years as an artist, the more of an appreciation I've had for how important backgrounds are, especially to storytelling and building worlds and, you know, being able to create these larger imaginary scenarios. This is kind of what I always wanted to do was you know, almost bring fantasy worlds to life. And I think backgrounds are a big part of that. And I think that also the more you get involved in narrative storytelling, comics, and even a lot of illustration, it's really important to understand how the background is kind of framed by the character and vice versa. And also how interesting, once you overcome a lot of the challenges that are actually involved with practically drawing and planning these things, how much, um, again, fun it can be to draw good backgrounds and how much character you can actually inject into them. So anyway, what I want to do is actually go over to the drawing table because then I can show you some examples and we can really get started with this first idea of what works. All right, first, let's just look at the range that might be possible. I think this is a really good example of 
amazingly detailed backgrounds. Um, it's something that always sort of sticks in my mind uh, by Schutten and Peters. Uh, I'm not sure I forget who is the artist and who is the writer for this one. But again, I feel like this artist and this style is very much um, what a lot of people, you know, imagine all French comic books are like is these kind of ridiculously elaborate backgrounds and details. And I think that, again, um, you know, this is just a amazing amazing work but always what I sort of think of when I imagine the pinnacle of sort of uh, you know old school French comics with this imagination this sense of fantasy grandeur these epic pages super detailed amazing compositions but again you know you can go crazy with backgrounds if you need where Really, the backgrounds here are a major, major character in the story. They're potentially a reason you would buy the book to imagine yourself journeying through these different environments. They're a major part of what makes the book work. And certainly, again, something that sticks in my mind after years and years and years of having this on the shelf is, you know, whenever I need inspiration for like, look, how far can you go? I always come back to this. Yeah, just look at this stuff. It's just amazing. Crazy, crazy, crazy sense of depth. Um, great compositions. Amazing sense of lighting. Surrealist style fantasy. Just goes on and on. And on. And on. And on. Maybe at sort of the other end of the spectrum of stuff that is still very, you know, successful, I would say probably much, much more successful in the marketplace is, you know, your standard sort of uh, shonen style uh, manga, right? So we've got some uh, One Piece, uh, some Sandland Toriyama, and some Naruto. So... Um, again, you know, typically what you'll find is it, it's not that there's no backgrounds in these. It's just that the main thing that people are focusing on here is the characters. I think that's mostly what you sort of remember is, you know, that time Naruto fought that guy and he did this thing and it was epic and it was cool. And you remember this kind of cool shot. We don't necessarily remember like where it was. And although there's a, a fully professional set of backgrounds here, we're not skimping on it and where there is a good establishing shot needed look certainly it's it's put into um into motion and done really well but you know the backgrounds are not why we why we come here and uh for me certainly i i have a vague recollection of like some sort of foresty place that they live but i certainly remember all the characters and that's why i care about this and you know i, I think it's probably fair to say that it's a similar story for a lot of the other, um, you know, sort of shonen style comics. Look, not all of them, right? You know, th there's a lot of different sort of styles here um, and, and situations where, again, the story requires more background. And while there seems to be more background in, you know, some of these than others, still, I think the thing that you kind of come back for are the crazy characters, the crazy antics, and, you know, a lot of that stuff. But again, um, you know, still lots and lots of backgrounds here, really, really detailed sense of place, Probably, again, you know, more so in One Piece than Naruto. If you look at a lot of the, you know, panels in the Toriyama book, again, there's a good sense of place. There's a good sense of where they are, um, you know, framing shots. But a lot of the things are very much based around framing the character, right? The backgrounds are there. It helps frame the character, the things that are sort of cool, the little objects. But th there's, there's really kind of a, a shot where you're like looking at the background and you're like, oh, yeah, right. Again, every now and then you're going to see something. But for the most part, these things focus much more on character. Often Western comics inhibit a space a little bit in between those two poles. Although, as we'll, you know, I'll show you as this progresses, a lot of those definitions of sort of manga, European comics, Western comics, they don't always hold up, right? There's, there's many, many varieties, and really we're dealing primarily with a, a global kind of style where, you know, anyone is going to break those boundaries if they want. But here we've got a good example of something by the amazing uh, David Finch, who, again, I followed for ages and ages and ages it's so cool he now has a youtube channel where you can watch him draw 
ridiculously crazy. But again, I feel like um, uh, he in he sort of embodies a, a really good sense of of how backgrounds are often handled in in sort of Western superhero comics, which is where again, similar to the manga stuff, the characters are the reason that we often come back. But there is probably a, a higher need to actually put in those backgrounds and kind of have them be a part of the story. But often what you'll find is if you really look at these and follow along, you kind of see that, again, they are playing second fiddle to the characters in most cases. And again, you kind of come there for Spider-Man and Wolverine. The backgrounds are there. They're handled really nicely. You know, they're drawn in perspective. But, you know, unlike some of those other, you know, books that you might see and we might sort of look at, they're not necessarily ever going to steal the show. You might have an establishing shot here and there, but for the most part, the backgrounds just kind of exist to frame the characters. So the key here is that there are many different ways that you can create comic books, and we'll get a little bit to illustration as well. But that is because often the style is defined by the genre, the type of mood you want in the story, and also the amount of time you've got to create the art. When I first came to create my first book, as I said, it was Seven Pirates, and I had to draw a lot of pirate ships. An interesting fact about this book is that the storyboards were actually done by Jérôme Lacurly, and what that gave me was an opportunity. Again, I could modify the storyboards, but I most of the time I chose not to because he did a really good job and it taught me a lot about composition. But this very much sort of eased me into the process of creating backgrounds because I didn't necessarily have to plan them. I just had to execute them and modify them if I needed to. Again, they were fairly detailed and a lot of the compositional elements were kind of figured out. A lot of the framing was figured out. And Again, uh, he had a really good advanced sense of what would or wouldn't work. And uh, again, my job really was just to keep up. But certainly there were a huge variety of different scenes that needed to be created. Interior scenes, exterior scenes, um, on ships, and just figuring out how to draw these things and, you know, create the perspective and, you know, match what the, the camera angle was from the storyboard was certainly its own challenge. And each page was uh, its own little sort of journey, trying to figure out how to make all of these things work. But certainly, again, you know, the style of story that this was required a lot of background. And that really is often, you know, that the general sort of sense of a European style book is we kind of need backgrounds. But again, not in all cases. Also, as I said, when I came to draw the second book that I created, I set the entire thing, for the most part, in a forest. This allowed me to do two things. Firstly, I really got to focus on actually drawing a single environment, working on you know my drawing of trees, painting of trees, all of these things. I like forest environments. That's something I wanted to get better at. And this allowed me to really dig into a single environment. There were a few other little environments. There was a sort of mountain rocky environment at the beginning. And there was also a um, village environment at some point in the middle that was something where, again, you know, I really tried to manage when I was doing that, uh, you know, and really limit the complexity there to just a few things that I knew would be possible. Because um, for the most part, this stuff was very, very challenging. The other thing that I sort of did using this particular technique and making sure it was all in one environment is I was playing very much with the idea of reusing elements, which is something I'll cover in a subsequent video in this series on backgrounds. But again, I think that a lot of the key here is that how much background you put in is defined by what the needs of the project are, how much control you have over it, and, you know, what the deadline is, right? A lot of that shonen manga is drawn with a really, you know, intense deadline. A lot of those really detailed European books get more time, and the Western ones sort of fit in the middle, and that's why, you know, in my experience, they kind of fit in the middle detail-wise as well. The real thing to take away from perhaps this entire video is that there are many different ways to create art, certainly if we're talking about comics. Now, although I think it's often easy to say that, look, 
mangas like this, uh, Western comics like this, French comics like that. As we'll sort of explore, that's not always the case, right? And here we've got some good examples of different ways that backgrounds are used in manga by different artists. So here we've got uh, Nausicaa by uh, Hayao Miyazaki. And you can see that this has, uh, you know, a very strong, probably at that time, uh, like Jean Giraud, Mobius um, in inspired uh, sort of line style to a certain degree. Um, I'm assuming that is the case at any rate and a very, very detailed look. So very different to a lot of the sort of shonen comics we were looking at before. We have very, very good sense of place, excellent series of establishing shots. Everything is kind of drawn with a lot more detail, but still, you know, you can see in many cases, there's only backgrounds when you need it. So, you know, there's not really any clouds or anything like that in the background. A lot of it is still being very efficient, but it feels like there is a really strong sense of place in this book. And I think that's important to understand. So, you can get out of your mind a little bit of this you know this these comics are like this these comics are like this um again there's a huge variety i think you'll find um in the different styles of western comics french comics and manga and uh again it's really a matter of figuring out you know what type of feeling does the story have and what type of artist do you admire so again, Miyazaki, really good sense of focusing on the character. But, you know, if you've seen uh, Nausicaa, the, the anime, if you've read this book, you know that the, the idea of place, the, the feeling of the environment, all this weird stuff that happens is so important to the story. And that's kind of what you remember. Well, certainly what I remember from reading it is like the, the weirdness of the world and the feeling of often these quite simple characters inhabiting that world but all these bugs and this crazy stuff and this feeling of sort of dirt the feeling of sort of claustrophobia you get when you know we're sort of going through those um sort of spore infested uh forests and things again it, it's not as if we're seeing that same level of kind of epic background here but the sense of place is much more present here in this book now if we look at some osama tezuka here we've got the buddha sort of adaptation which uh, again i have no idea how accurate that is but this is a great example of where if you kind of imagine tezuka's work you often imagine the very simplistic style but um the backgrounds are actually a really really important thing here if we look at them and i'll, I'll see there's some sort of not safe for work panels in here so we'll see how we go um but yeah there, there's so many instances here where you just get this really interesting sense of place and a lot of that is defined by the way that these sort of backgrounds work. And there's a great sense of like where they are and also when we need, right? A feeling of sort of weather, all these different environments. But, you know, this seems to be, again, that this particular style has a, a much, much more um, of a focus on the actual backgrounds than you would see in, you know, your sort of classic modern uh, shonen manga like Naruto. So again, you know, it's, it's, there's no real rules here. Same thing goes for something like Horaka Samura's Blade of the Immortal, which uh, again, lots of not for safe work in here. So hopefully we'll be okay. Um, but yeah, the, the backgrounds are sketchy. They're sort of vague, but there's a really good sense of texture of place of like the fact that people are walking through environments and often not just that, but the backgrounds and the framing is used to help the storytelling in some really sort of epic ways. There's so many sort of crazy environmental shots where it's just like people walking through buildings. And I feel like often really interesting as well that i feel like in this the backgrounds are often used you have these kind of really strong diagonal lines that are really good at framing the action and helping the emotion of the character even though you could kind of have this be more vague there's this weird abstract nature to it that i think really helps the storytelling often
we have good juxtaposition between these sort of abstract shots again good framing good establishing big shots of characters there is a really good sense of place even though it's not specific i think it's really clear and if you if you've read blade of the immortal you know a lot of the fight scenes really involve the terrain right you really need to understand where people are in order to understand the action of what's happening and i think that Again, there's a really clear sense of where people are sitting and the fact that, you know, the environment that they're in is influencing their emotion. If we look at illustration as another example, there is a huge variety of different degrees to which artists focus on the background and how much they put in. This is just a simple book that has a few different artists in it, so it gives us a good opportunity to look at some different um, approaches. We've got some classic sort of Alan Lee where this is all about the background, right? I always remember this illustration. It's just sort of so epic here. Um, I think it's the idea of sort of, uh, uh, again, it's the sword and the stone. And yeah, just this sort of epic feeling of the background really emphasizing the character there. And again, you see other instances where it really feels like Alan Lee puts a lot of focus into the backgrounds, right? There is a sense of space and his ability to create interest with just a background, I think, is really, really next level. And then you have, you know, a lot of other artists where sometimes there's backgrounds, sometimes there's not. But in, in most cases, right, you know, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, a really good artist such as uh, Brom, then, you know, it, it's, it's really about the graphic nature of the illustration. Yes, there's a background, but it's always similar to, you know, the manga um, style illustration. The background is there to support the character. And these are all people who have extremely successful. Here's some uh, John Howe illustration. All these people are successful, right? It's a matter of understanding, you know, what you want to actually do with your art. On a different note, backgrounds don't always have to be something where it's a literal sense of place. You can give a sense of complexity to an image. Uh, and I think this is always a fun sort of example. Uh, Ohari uh, Noriyoshi, who is a sort of interesting mix of like um, sort of Western style with some of this poster design, but unmistakably Japanese design as well. And again, you know, there's a really sort of fun sense of abstraction with a lot of these images. There are backgrounds there, but the backgrounds are there to kind of to support the abstract composition and the dynamism of the things within the frame. So again, you know, a lot of this depends what you want to do, how you're going to use these things. Backgrounds are not always just about drawing scenes a lot of it is about framing the action and, and helping to create dynamic composition and using the background environments to do that as i said it's important to get a little bit away from sort of cultural specific stereotypes french comics for instance have a huge variety of different styles and storytelling um, types right you know you have your classic sort of Auge, um, the adventures of tintin which has it's very, very simplistic style, you know, mixed with, uh, you know, sort of almost photo real backgrounds. And a lot of these were actually based on photographic reference from my understanding, because, uh, you know, that was the idea it was that, yes, we have a cartoony world. Yes, it's all very simple, but, you know, the backgrounds have an accuracy to them that is really important. And I think if you look at a lot of these scenes, there is a really, really serious sense of consistency here. Um, and again, I think that's, uh, you know, just a, a part of the desire to kind of mix this feeling of realism and consistency um, with the you know, sense of cartooniness there. On the other hand, you could look at something like uh, Enki Bilal, who, again, also very, very popular, very, very successful. Really, really amazing sort of sense of mood of place but if you look at a lot of the backgrounds right you know again some of them we got these epic kind of shots um you know in, in other instances we have pretty sort of vague painted sort of mush in the background but still you know if, if you read a lot of these things it's nevertheless very clear where these people are and what is going on and what is important in the scene but 
you know, not every French comic has hyper detailed backgrounds, right? In many cases, um, you know, it's not even about the characters. It's about, you know, just the general feel and how much is communicated with the brushstrokes and the technique and, you know, the story itself. Likewise, there's a huge variety of amazing uh, French artists who lean much more into heavily stylized and graphic representation. Here you've got uh, Bruno and creating some really, really cool simplified art, still with a pretty good sense of background though, but much more simplified. So, you know, again, it's all a matter of understanding the intent, um, how these things are going to be printed, how much time people have to create different types of book, etc. But again, there's a huge, huge variety of different styles out there. And I definitely recommend trying to learn about um, as many of these as possible. One of the things that I think is so important to do is to look at the artists that you like and actually see what is going on in the background. Because one of the tricks is that frequently there's magic and mysticism going on. And again, I've been often surprised by this when I actually go and look. So again, we've got Massimo and Chirot's Ghost in the Shell, classic, classic manga. If you look at this, again, it's a real mix of this feeling of infinite complexity with a lot of these drawings and these sort of epic establishing shots where we've got these really, really well-drawn um, vehicles, environments, situations. But, you know, like a lot of other manga much of the focus is on the characters. We've got good establishing shots. Everything's drawn really well in the background, obviously. But, you know, in many cases, the real focus is on the action. And the things that you remember are not necessarily the environment. Also, again, if you really look closely at a lot of this stuff, you know, it's not necessarily drawn perfectly, right? A lot of it is fairly simple. And again, that's fine. You know, that doesn't really negatively impact, uh, you know, our appreciation of the work at all. And, uh, you know, again, I think that's always important to understand is just kind of really closely look at the backgrounds, how much detail is in there, how much consistency is in there. And that'll give you a good idea for kind of what your threshold will be. As opposed to, again, imagining how detailed this is. Because often the trick is with backgrounds and with a lot of art, we're kind of connecting these things up. So when we see some epic shot of like a Tachikoma tank or some kind of, you know, attack tank there, and then you kind of see that same tank uh, moving around the environment, you kind of carry with you the afterglow of that detail when you see things. And it's the same with characters, right? We kind of imagine the character when they're drawn with their sort of hero shot, and we transpose that feeling to all of the other panels. And I think this often happens with a lot of sequential art. So pay close attention to what is actually there in the background. Similarly, pay attention to the way that, especially if you're interested in comics, people do frame and uh, set up the action. So you've got some classic Alex Toth, um, some Zorro comics. And again, the thing that's often really good to pay attention to is the sequence with which the action is framed. We often have, when you're dealing with a really, really accomplished storyteller like Alex Toth, some good framing of the action, right? Here we've got a really good sense of like, bang, look at this. We know exactly where everything is. And here we've got some stuff that's maybe a little bit rougher. Here we've got no background, right? Very vague background. Eh, again, you know, just framing the action. We've got nothing. Here we've got a wide shot letting it breathe. Again, very simple background here um, using some good dynamic action. Again, all of these panels look amazing from a basic design perspective. There's good lines, good way that the action is framed. Um, but again, if you actually look at what's there, it's often very, very rough. And I think that's so important. But still, if you read this book, you get a good sense of place. You get a good sense of where these people are, of what's happening. And you're never kind of sitting there going like, oh, I don't know. But there's a real efficiency with people who are coming from this sort of school of, of comic art where 
you need to be kind of brutal with when you draw backgrounds and how simple things are and how you frame the action and how you communicate. So that's something that's always also important to pay attention to is how, not just, you know, how is the background drawn and is it good or not, but how the idea of that background is carried throughout the story. Lastly, here's a few examples of artists who I think do a really good job of mixing everything up. I think uh, Enrico Marini is, you know, one of the best at having a really great sense of place. Really amazing characters that have a lot of life, had a lot of uh, exaggeration. Um, again, you know, I, I probably just sort of like the style in general. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel like there's a lot of sort of life and, and emotion to a lot of these characters. But still, the backgrounds are epic, right? There's a really great sense of place, um, of detail, of, um, you know, the situation. And again, you know, just amazing mix of like things that feel like they could come out of a, you know, landscape painter's book, right? Um, just amazing composition with sort of nothing in it. Again, good example of how we're framing the establishing shot. And then we kind of understand, okay, this is where they are. They're in this castle. We have all of these cool characters. We kind of get a feeling for where they are. Then we carry that across very vague sort of thing in the background here, almost nothing in the background there. And, uh, you know, again, the same idea is carried across, right? Again, good establishing shots, um, you know, sort of close up shots. So often so much of this is, is getting the balance right. Um, and uh, again, you know, I think this is a really good example of, uh, you know, where we need dialogue, we've got good dialogue, where we need sort of epic action shots, we've got epic action shots, we need a nice establishing shot, we've got that, it's nicely composed, etc., etc. Similarly, Matthew Bonhomme, one of my favorite artists, I think really nails this good sense of a mix, right? We have amazing establishing shots that feel like, you know, they come out of a, a landscape painting. Nicely composed, great sense of composition, of color, of direction, of place, of detail. Again, great way that the detail is, you know, fading off into the distance, has a great sense of place. And then we further establish and there's still, you know, great background details where we need, um, none where we don't. And again, you know, reestablishing the environment, it's really easy to see what's sort of happening as we progress from one part of the story to the other. And again, you know, I just think these are amazing, amazing pages. Color changes, the environment changes, we breathe, we step back, we go in, it's simpler, we focus on dialogue, we move from one scene to another, we establish, re-establish, etc., etc. So again, these are just some good examples of situations where I feel like, again, there's just a good balance. Anyway, so hopefully that should give you a little bit of an idea of maybe what's possible, right? Or at least to try and illustrate the framing of this question a little bit better. A big part of how you draw backgrounds is a matter of what kind of backgrounds you want to draw. How important are they to you? How are you going to use them? Are they, you know, going to just be a part of the action? Are they there to frame the characters? What's important to you? What do you actually care about? Now, the challenge here, I guess, is that choosing is not necessarily easy. This is quite a challenge to figure out what you actually want to do. And I think the really important thing here is to pay attention to not just kind of what you like looking at, but what you like doing, what things make you excited. Do you really feel like you want to spend that much time on a background? And when you think about the stories that you want to create, you know, do you want to sit there spending 40 hours creating a single image that has that massive sense of space, of place? of, you know, characters traversing through an environment or just the epic nature of an environment itself. These are the questions you need to answer. Not just that, but, you know, do you actually like drawing them? And, you know, how do they actually fit into your grand plan? There's lots and lots of different options here. And I think the most important thing you can do is just to look at a bunch of art and really look at it closely. Because as I said, one of the most mysterious things about background is that they're often framed in our imagination. Even if you look at illustrations, right, we're looking at simple things. You have an artist like Brom, right, who has often just single characters, you know, fairly uh, formally composed on a page. But 
through looking at the character and the little bit of vagueness of the background, you get a sense of where they are. And it's often that maybe the vagueness or the lack of like some detailed diorama back there really helps to give it a sense of fantasy, right? Of these characters kind of existing in this void. It's not necessarily simple. It's not a matter of more background is better. It's really a matter of how much background is right for you. Obviously, this is something that can change over time. This is a journey after all. This is your artistic journey. And a lot of what you find that you do like doing is going to change when you actually do it and you figure out, you know, whether you want to do that. Um, do you want to spend that much time? How important is, are these things to you? What kind of medium are you working in? But the key here is that if you have direction, it's going to give you the first steps that you need to follow. If you do really want to put in those epic backgrounds, you're going to have to learn perspective. You're going to have to have a process for figuring that out. You're going to have a whole system for how this kind of functions. Um, if you don't plan on putting on a lot of backgrounds, then you better have a story that's going to be really engaging on a character level. You better have like a Naruto style sort of excitement to what's happening with the characters and their action and every panel needs to be exciting and dynamic from purely a character perspective because again if you can't draw backgrounds you can't ever, you can't ever sort of step back and sort of let things breathe a little bit more you got to use different techniques either way a lot of the key here is understanding what you're not going to do because look some people get a good mix of both happening there but most people are figuring out what they're trying to say with their illustrations, with their comics, with their books. They have a good artistic vision and they're using all the different techniques, especially the backgrounds to support that. And in order to do that, they probably said no to a lot of options because the no allows them to do the thing that they want to do. So you do have to figure out not just what you are going to do, but what you're not going to do to give you that focus that's going to allow you to move forward. The practical implementation of this is quite simple. The amount of planning you need to do for a more detailed background is a lot more. It's not just a matter of more drawing. It's a matter of really understanding that as you add more detail, you need to increase the level of visual library that you have. You need to increase the level of fidelity of the actual plan. As you move around that environment, if it's very detailed, people will notice that, you know, the cups and things that are on a table are in a different spot, whereas everything's kind of a little bit vague. It sort of doesn't matter. And that really is the key is you're expanding not just the drawing work, but the planning work. And that's a lot of what I want to cover in the following videos is how you actually plan, keep these environments consistent and just what is involved in doing that. And what are all the different tricks, including 3D, etc that you can use to make this a little bit easier but it's never going to be that easy again a lot of this comes down to visual library understanding what needs to go the where and keeping you know these environments in your mind to a certain degree so you understand the space that your characters are inhabiting and how important it is for the narrative thrust of your image. All right, that's all we got time for on this one. Let me know if you've got any thoughts or comments down below. Again, I'm gonna follow this up with another set of much more practical videos, right? That really talk about how we actually go about drawing backgrounds, how we go about planning them, etc. But I think this topic is probably the most important because if you don't really figure out where you wanna go, you don't have a good idea of what's possible, often it can seem like, hey, look, I just got this infinite amount of stuff I can draw and the more stuff I can draw, the better. It's not necessarily the case, but let me know what you think, whether you got any ideas or requests for things to cover in this series, and I will endeavor to do that. Leave me a comment, like, etc. That stuff all helps, and we'll see you in the next one.